Coast Drama, written by you, the American people, and brought to you by the General Tire and Rubber Company, in cooperation with your friendly General Tire dealer. The Greatest Drama, the memorable living stories of the great among us. This chapter, Ace of Aces, the story of Captain Eddie Rickenbacker. The place was Washington. It was December 1942. Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was relating one of the grimmest tales of the Second World War, the story of his three weeks adrift in a life raft in the Pacific Ocean. Our prayers were answered. And if we hadn't had, or I hadn't had, seven witnesses, I wouldn't dare tell the story. For a seagull landed on my head and gave us food to sustain us for two days and sufficient bait to the use of its intestines in order that we may catch a couple of fish. Afterwards, Secretary of War Stimson commented, Welcome home. I said it once before, and I say it now again. The usual rules of faith do not apply to you. I said that. The rules of faith had never applied to Eddie Rickenbacker. Ever since the beginning in Columbus, Ohio, at the turn of the 20th century, Eddie had made his own rules. His family lived on the wrong side of the track. Grinding poverty produced a kid who was tough, stubborn, and rebellious. His father couldn't handle him, neither could his teachers. Neighbors predicted he would come to a bad end. Then his father died, and Eddie became breadwinner of the family. No more school. The boy found a job in a shop which produced those newfangled gasoline buggies. One day he read that two brothers named Wright had actually flown an airplane. They became his heroes. Perhaps he too might become an aviator. But first he had to learn all there was to know about cars. Eddie was 15 when he took his first automobile ride. The next step, automobile racing. Indianapolis, 1911, the first 500-mile race in history was beginning. Among the drivers entered was 21-year-old Eddie Rickenbacker. His first big race, seven hours of mental and physical agony. He didn't hope to win. If he finished in the money, that would be enough. Other drivers crashed through the fence, but the rules of fate didn't apply to Eddie. He didn't win, but he did finish in the money. Soon he was famous as the daredevil of the track. By 1916, he stood third among the speed kings. That year, he earned $40,000. Next year, he might well become an America's top-ranking driver. But Eddie gave it up for a chance to become an aviator. 1917, the United States had declared war on Germany. Rickenbacker enlisted as a doughboy, hoping to get transferred to the Air Corps. It didn't work out that way. Eddie became a driver for General Pershing's staff. His request for transfer rejected. Too old, not enough education, too good a driver. It seemed he would serve out the war behind the wheel. Then Eddie met General Billy Mitchell, America's first great advocate of air power. Mitchell took a liking to the young speed demon. He pulled a few strings and Eddie got his transfer. In that brand new officer's uniform, you were the proudest pilot in the Air Force. Your outfit was the 94th Squadron. In defiance of the enemy, you named it the Hat in the Ring Squadron. But could you, a novice, hold your own against the German aces? You soon proved that you could hold your own and more. April 1918, your first encounter with the enemy. You were flying a routine patrol when several German pilots jumped you. In a moment, there was a wild scramble in the sky as you fought for your life. Swinging behind a German plane, you lined him up in your gun sight. He peeled off, trying to escape. But you hung on, and a moment later, he went down in flames. The first kill of many. Soon you were a captain and an ace decorated for bravery. You became commander of your squadron. A born leader, you set an example of determination and courage for your men. The 94th quickly became the outstanding group in the American Army. 
it led all others in bombing missions and enemy planes brought down. You're a fighting leader in the air daily, searching for Germans. Your score of victories grew steadily as the months passed. Twelve Germans shot down by September 1918, 22 by October, 26 by November. In recognition of valor, more decoration for you and your men. When the war ended in November, you were America's ace of aces. Peace at last. Hands that had held guns were now outstretched in friendship, and with peace, thoughts of the future. You would not go back to automobile racing. You had learned where you belonged. Your future was in aviation. To Detroit, in 1919, went Eddie Rickenbacker after his discharge from the Army. With financial backing, he began the manufacture of automobiles. Sternly realistic, he knew aviation was then still in its infancy. Somehow, he would get back into flying later on. Right now, he wanted to make money. His was the first American stock car to use four-wheel brakes. Newly married, he seemed slated for success. But his car was too advanced for the public, and the company failed. Eddie took a job selling automobiles. But the United States did not forget her ace of aces. Eddie Rickenbacker was the most decorated flyer of the First World War. Now, with President Herbert Hoover looking on, he received the most highly prized decoration of all, the Congressional Medal of Honor, a proud moment for Captain Eddie, his wife, and son. There was another proud moment when Eddie was named Divisional Sales Manager of the General Motors Corporation. He worked hard, gained the trust of his superiors. But Eddie still loved planes. And in 1933 came the chance to go back into aviation. At that time, Eastern was a rundown operation. Against the advice of friends, Eddie took over and set to work reorganizing the airline. He was constantly traveling, flying the route, revamping the operation from top to bottom. His knowledge of flying and instinct for leadership came into play. As he had inspired his men of the old 94th Squadron, so now he inspired his co-workers at Eastern. Hard work brought results. The line began to make money. Then, in 1938, unless Eddie bought the line, he was out. He went to Wall Street for financial backing. All he could offer as security was his name and record. But that was enough. He got the money. Ownership of the line involved even more work and greater responsibility. New planes were ordered, the most modern the industry could produce. Rickenbacker personally supervised details of construction. A happy moment as one of the new airliners was christened by the then First Lady, Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt. The event had its humorous side. Mrs. FDR couldn't break the champagne bottle. Then tragedy in 1941. Eddie was flying south. Near Atlanta, Georgia, the airliner crashed. Rickenbacker had been trapped in the wreckage with broken ribs and gasoline burns. Although in terrible pain, he refused to be removed until the last passenger had been rescued. It was hours before he could be taken to the hospital. The doctors gave him up for loss. But as usual, the rules of fate didn't apply to Eddie. He recovered. 1942, America was at war, and again you tossed your hat into the ring. Back on your feet, you helped to boost morale on the home front. Then, a visit with the boys of the new 94 Squadron. You wished them good luck and good hunting. Too old to fight, but for you, General Arnold, commander of the Army Air Force, had a more important duty, a mission to MacArthur in the Southwest Pacific. Pickham Field, Hawaii, first leg of the long flight. You talked there with the GIs while your plane was being made ready. Next stop, Canton Island, 1,800 miles away. With a good ship and a good crew, the length of the hop was nothing to worry about. Or so you thought. Far out in the Pacific, the plane went off course, lost over the ocean. Fuel tanks almost empty. 
You took command. When the tanks were empty, you ordered a crash landing in the ocean. Things happened quickly. Water flooded the ship as she hit the sea. You knew she'd sink fast, only a few seconds to float the life raft and abandon the plane. In the confusion, food and water was forgotten as you watched the plane go down. Eight men adrift on three rafts. For food, only a seagull, a few fish, and some rainwater. Twenty-four days passed. One man died, the others were close to death. You had given up all hope when the night was lit with flares and a plane landed nearby. Rescue. It was hard to believe. They had found you in the nick of time. Another day might have been too late. They brought Eddie and his men to the Air Force base at Samoa, suffering from starvation, exhaustion, shock, covered with sores from long exposure to the sea, into the hospital for rest and treatment. Prognosis? Unfavorable. But again, Eddie cheated death. Two weeks later, he was ready to go on and complete his mission. Then, home to Washington. The Army had prepared a hero's welcome. But for Eddie, the three most important people on the field were his wife and son. Drifting on that raft, he had been certain he would never see them again. It was good to be back. He had proved with his life as a pilot and airline executive that the rules of fate did not apply to him. Eddie Rickenbacker, ace of aces. This drama was brought to you by the General Tire and Rubber Company and your friendly General Tire dealer who sells America's top quality General Tires and Tubes. Be with us next week at this time when the General Tire and Rubber Company and your General Tire dealer present another chapter from The Greatest Drama.